together and you can zoom in and spot people in the crowd and see people in there. So I was really fascinating, fascinated with um, how you could use technology with immersive content to start really telling a story or uh, bringing people into the world that I've been at. And um, one of the other experiments I did was with 360 degree time lapse. So I had a kind of ball of Nikons that I, I stuck together and we were inside this pod for 24 hours while the London I stopped for one day and captured this full 360 degree view. Um, and as I was doing all these projects, I started to get, I started to get known. I got stuff in the BBC, in the Times, um, I was getting stuff in Wired, Channel 4, and in the illustrious Nikon newsletter, of course. Um, and I got picked up, crucially though, by Getty Images. Um, and they took me along to the Olympics. And it was the first time that they had a <laughs> photographer at the Olympics producing 360 degree content dedicated, and this is me narrowly avoiding, well actually being kind of squashed by a very sweaty Argentinian basketball player there, but crucially keeping that Nikon lens completely dry and clean. Um, and I was just rotating the pole and capturing 360 photos that were then viewed on kind of flat surfaces on desktops. And so I started experimenting more and more, and these kind of hacked together early cameras made from 3D printed shells were being put together and we'd capture 360 video on them and throw it off a cliff attached to a person, uh, stuff like that, and, and get quite exciting footage. But if you're always just viewing it on a flat screen uh, or you know on a mobile device that you can maybe move in front of you, it kind of had a limited uh, degree of excitement it could generate. But unbeknownst to me, this guy, Palmer Lucky, in his parents' garage, uh, you know, around 18 years old, started gluing together and, and hacking together bits of mobile phone components. And I found this incredible marriage of putting 360 degree videos onto these headsets, and it was a whole new medium. It's something which I had never seen before, where you're actually inside that video, you're inside that film, inside that story, you can really transport people. And when you get it completely right and you make something very seamless, which is comfortable and captivating, you actually achieve this thing, sometimes you get it just right, called presence, where you feel like you're actually in another world, even if, it does, if you know, it's just kind of fleeting, which sounds a bit familiar, right? Um, it doesn't need to be a kind of creepy, evil, dark world. It can be a great fun one, you know, for the sports and fun stuff. Um, so, a new medium but also, I should say, a new meme as well. It produced probably some of the most ridiculous pictures on the internet. Um, all <laughs> kinds of very unflattering shots like this came out. But I think the thing I'd like to point out about them is that there is a lot of fun happening in these shots. There's a lot of magic, and there's a real kind of wonder that people have when they try VR, which is quite a unique thing in technology. I think there's very few things that people look at now as a new tech and actually get really blown away by. Um, but VR online constantly kind of, and you know, in print, not really putting its best foot forward. Uh, there's a terrible Time magazine cover which had some excellent kind of jokes made out of it. I love these. There's some really shocking ones though, but uh, <laughs> these are the thick of the bunch. Um, I could go on all day on those though. But um, in terms of how big VR is actually going to be, um, this guy, Mark Zuckerberg, bought Oculus, I think it was $2 billion last year, and he is a passionate believer in virtual reality and thinks it's going to be this absolutely massive thing in part of our daily lives. And there's all kinds of stats out there, and there's all these um, bits of research done by Capital, Goldman Sachs, um, and one of the most interesting ones says, the end of this year we're going to have 30, oh, sorry, 43 million users which is quite an incredible figure, considering this started from scratch only a couple of years ago. And the industry is meant to be worth $30 billion by 2020, which is obviously a stonking figure. But the one I'm most amazed by is this one, and this is a Goldman Sachs thing, that VR is set to be bigger than TV by 2025 in revenue, which is really hard to get your head around now when you try these kind of early headsets on and think, well, how can we actually get to that point? So I'll show you as we, as we go through this presentation, like some of the steps that I think we can take to get there. So in terms of the industries using VR now, it's actually harder to find industries that aren't using it 
I mean, you started off with the more obvious applications of travel and automotive. We were doing stuff, all kinds of car brands or travel brands. Um, music and kind of live events have been really, really caught on. But then one of the ones that really surprised us and is actually a kind of a good example of a perfect fit for VR is charities. And um, one of our big projects has been with Medicine Sans Frontier um, in a project called Force From Home. It's taken us a year to do it. We've been, from, we've been to South Sudan, Iraq, Tanzania, Lebanon, recording these stories of the people in these refugee camps in some of the most inhospitable places in the world, uh, and the doctors that work there as well. And actually, you're face to face with these people who are telling their story, and they're looking down the barrel of the lens, so they're looking right at you and you see the whites in their eyes, and you have this quite strong emotional connection, which is down also to the fact that you think you're in another place, so you really feel like you're there with them. And from the point of view of a charity, this kind of idea of empathy VR has been absolutely massive. Um, but there's a lot of buzz around VR, and there's a lot of smoke and mirrors, um, and a lot of it seems to be about PR and you know what's the next big thing. But there's actually starting to be some, from our perspective as a studio, we're finding a lot of very good kind of real world stats that are really backing up VR as not just a fad, but as something which is actually really impactful. Um, and one of the main ones we did was with Thomas Cook, um, where we did a series of films which took you on kind of five minute holidays in different locations around the world. They called it Try Before You Fly. And um, they found when they showed people these holidays in stores, that they were 80% more likely to then go and book that holiday. And so they started rolling this thing out and shooting all the different locations they have. Um, working with the army, they found we showed day in the life of kind of new recruits from the army or training they can do in tank driving or parachuting or climbing. And they had 66% more recruits when people were using VR. And a project recently with Google and the F and FT, um, taking you into the favelas in Rio uh, to show how they're changing in the run-up to the Olympic Games. Um, well, I think one of the things that they found most interesting was that people were actually watching the video through to the end through YouTube 360. People were actually finishing it. So the average dwell time, as an average, was two and a half minutes, which is unheard of in, in video online. So the VR production industry uh, itself has just been growing <coughs> as fast as the kind of hype that surrounds VR. And this image here was put together by Greenlight back in 2015. And I think that now there's actually double the number of companies going in there. But it's seen as this kind of gold rush as well. And it's getting this moniker of the kind of wild west of tech. Um, and it's something that producers in the industry, content producers, have to be very responsible to avoid this kind of moniker. And very responsible with the kind of content we produce. Because it's a very unique industry in how that content can affect people with a headset on. It's a very intense thing. Bad content is felt a lot more strongly than in any other medium. And one of the big things that people always talk about in VR is comfort. And what this comes down to is making sure that what you produce is smooth, uh, it's, it's comfortable for people to wear, and essentially it doesn't turn their stomach, which is actually quite a hard feat to achieve and still make it exciting. So the big rule in VR for all producers is, first of all, comfort is king. That's our kind of foundation block. So in terms of what's next for VR and how we're going to get to the point of this family actually sitting there and putting headsets on instead of watching TV, um, I think there's going to be a few steps that we need to take and there's going to be a few things that happen in the industry that are going to really encourage this. And I think the, the biggest thing is this the, the first thing that's going to happen is gaming. And I think games, you know, different consoles are bringing out headsets at the moment. Google is just releasing a new platform which is going to have lots of games on it as well. And I think these are going to be the first thing that really drive adoption into homes. And following off the back of games, I think entertainment's going to be absolutely vital as well. I mean, from the music industry's perspective, the idea that you could be backstage or on stage with your favorite band members, even choosing which band member you want to be next to, is absolutely amazing. You can actually, they can, one, of, one of the issues the music industry has been facing is that um, streaming sites are kind of eating away at their revenues. And so the live gig is even more important. But there's only limited size to a stadium. But with VR, you can give people an experience they couldn't actually have. 
I mean, sure, it doesn't ever beat the real thing, but at least you don't get beer thrown on you, and you can kind of choose which member of the band you want to be next to. Um, and the sports, uh, you can choose which, which position around the court you want to be. You could even in the future sit there with your virtual friend who's in a different country and watch your favourite team play from the best seat in the house as well. And films are going to be absolutely fascinating. Um, right now we see a lot of experiments coming out of Hollywood. We see The Jungle Book, um, Jurassic Park have done a VR trailer, um, The Martian. They're all trailers at the moment, but they're going to evolve into longer form things. And I think what's quite interesting actually is that films aren't going to stay as they are. They're going to have to change. Because one of the big objections that people have in 360 degree videos and in kind of film or cinematic VR content is that they feel like a bit of a ghost in the scene. They feel like they're there, but nobody kind of sees they're there, nobody acknowledges them. So Patrick Swayze has actually kind of become known for this. It's called the Swayze effect in VR. If you're there watching a scene, but you can't influence it in any way. So I think you're going to start seeing a lot more VR films that have people in there that actually look at you, look at the camera, and you feel that connection. Or maybe they talk to you at some point and you get some choices and you can actually influence where the outcome of that film goes. And from that point, it's something interactive, actually. It's not even a film, really, anymore. It's more of an experience. Retail is going to be a big thing for VR. Um, the idea that you could reach into a shop and pick up an object and hold it in front of you and move it around, and it's been beautifully 3D scanned, uh, that's really powerful when you compare that to kind of wiping down a kind of white a white sheet of pages on a, on a website with flat images on. If you can actually pick one of, those, one of those items out and look at it, that's quite powerful. And you also, from a brand's perspective, if you can build a shop which has absolutely no real-world constraints <coughs> to it, there's no cost limit to what you can build because there's no, you don't have to pay rent. You can make a shop, shop as out there as you want, as perfect as you want, and you can have any kind of shop assistant scan so Wayne Rooney can come up and sell you football boots or shirts or whatever. Uh, if, if that's what you want. Um, but I think the thing, the real nut that needs to be cracked though, is um, making VR social. And this is why Facebook invested in it in the first place. And actually, people will, it, Facebook sees social as, or see, sorry, sees virtual reality as one of the biggest social enablers in the world. And at the moment, it seems quite isolating. But there'll be these virtual worlds that people can go into, something called like a metaverse, where you go in, you put your VR headset on, and you can meet people. And whether or not that's for kind of practical business reasons, where you're planning around a virtual table and drawing on things and sharing ideas together when you're all in different countries, or completely social stuff in kind of customized private rooms that your friends designed, all of that is going to be absolutely vital in making VR something that people want to do on a daily basis and, and actually get to this point. The Simpsons actually released this VR experience just yesterday, so I kind of shoehorned it in. I was delighted. Um, so, but you know, this consumer adoption is a huge behavioural change, and for families to put VR on instead of watching Netflix or whatever else is going to be a kind of long-term thing. It's not going to be overnight. And actually, Mark Zuckerberg himself said that you know, five to ten years is what he thinks it will take for true consumer adoption. And 360 video is going to be absolutely vital for all of this. So one of the leading headsets has just released figures recently that says that 50% of the content that's watched on their headsets is 360 degree video, which is absolutely huge. Um, and so long as, uh, you know, cameras like the key mission are, are going to be absolutely vital for that, because what it's going to do from my perspective is open open up VR to a huge amount of potential filmmakers. And so long as they kind of follow the rules of comfort and are careful with what they produce, I think we're going to see a huge amount of new ideas flooding up in the industry. And I can't wait to see them and share them. Thank you. <laughs>